Most military procurement systems have a fairly similar cycle when it comes to adopting new equipment. Send out a contract, review bids sent in by companies, and then select the best of the collection, followed by awarding production orders to those that build a prototype that actually meets the requirements of the challenge. If any problems are encountered with the prototype, they're solved before the type goes into mainstream production, or are solved as soon as possible if lack of technology is a factor. This entire system has been tried, tested, and succeeded for many countries. Except in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, who use a, a different approach to procuring new equipment. The personification of the Soviets' weird process for procurement of combat aircraft can be found in the tale of the Soviet Union's mainline fighter during the opening hours of Operation Barbarossa. No, this isn't the Yak-1. This is a story about its cousin, the Lag-3, and, to a very mild extent, the MiG-3. Look, when I said Soviet procurement for aircraft was weird, I wasn't kidding. The Lag was made by OKB-301, often called Lavochkin, and was led by Semyon Lavochkin, Vladimir Gorbunov, and Mikhail Gudkov, their last initials being where the Lag designation comes from. The strangeness of its beginnings is the fact there wasn't any official order or challenge the lag was made for. The OKB was simply asked to make a modern fighter, with very ambiguous requirements on top speed, armament, or maneuverability. The only real guidance they had was that it needed to succeed the I-16 and thus should be superior in some notable aspects. This same sort of ambiguous design goal and requirements would also be handed to Mikoyan Gurevich and Yakovlev, which is why the Yak-1 and MiG-3 would come out almost one after another in a short time frame. OKB-301's first attempt would be the I-301, later renamed Lag-1, and was a low-wing monoplane powered by the Klimov M105P, a licensed Hispano-Suiza design. Built primarily from delta wood, it was rugged, resilient to rough conditions across the Soviet Union, and fairly inexpensive to build. However, the delta wood required chemicals that were toxic to workers and not available in amounts needed for full-time production, and the lag itself when test flown in 1940 was found to be very underpowered and extremely sluggish. After analysis and review, the OKB found many minor defects and design flaws that contributed to this poor performance. Modifications were then made to address these problems, as well as some new requirements for more range, which gave the aircraft a new name, being now designated the Lag-3. First flown in March of 1940, test pilot A. Nikashin found the new Lag-3 to be a fairly decent aircraft, maneuverable, good handling, and easily mastered by average pilots. In early June of the same year, the state acceptance trials began, which pushed the aircraft to its limits and also uncovered a new swath of faults and defects in the design, Except, instead of going back and fixing them, the USSR placed high priority on the design's immediate introduction to mass production only a few weeks later. In an effort to meet the quota of the high priority order, the factories building the Lag-3 had found many things they could cut corners on to save time. Namely, any sort of procedure or process that was tangibly related to quality assurance. This means that when the first deliveries were made to squadrons in Soviet Asia, the aircraft were of exceptionally poor quality. Whether it be a bad hydraulic system, broken control rods, engines that wore out too quickly, yellow cockpit glass you couldn't see out of, or my personal favorite, gun sights replaced with a dot on the canopy, not a single lag was made without at least one defective system. No, not part, an entire system. This spurred yet another wave of revisions and modifications by Lavochkin's OKB, this time in the magnitude of 2000. But as waiting for all 2,000 modifications to be completed would stop production, the Soviet Union instead ordered Lavochkin to introduce these modifications, as well as any new improvements in armament, engines, or additional features, in iterative series. This was exacerbated even further as in June of 1941 there was a new problem. Several million Germans currently invading the country. Operation Barbarossa hit the Soviet Air Force hard in the beginning and destroyed many aircraft on the ground, including Lag-3s. Being outperformed and outnumbered by the BF 109s and Falco 490s Luftwaffe was fielding, the Lag 3 suffered heavily and earned the nickname of the Guaranteed Varnished Coffin, as it had a nasty habit of shattering when hit by German autocannons. When the Soviet Air Force was able to reorganize, German bombers soon discovered the Lag was fast enough to catch them and also had a nasty autocannon of their own that brought them down in just a few hits. 
Despite Barbarossa's effects on Soviet industry, Lavochkin did its best to introduce these modifications mentioned earlier as production continued, incorporating such changes as a lighter fuselage, new automatic leading edge slats, adjustments to the armament, and even revisions to the radiator, rudder, and propeller. Though pilots generally disliked the lag's performance, it was effective against enemy bombers and could soak up a lot of return fire so long as autocannons weren't involved. Seeing as most German bombers of the time were armed with low-caliber flexible machine guns, interdiction and interception became a natural role for the lag, generally leaving the fighting of other fighters to aircraft like the Yak-1. Speaking of which, the end of the Lag-3 would come about in 1944, where its production line was repurposed for the Yak-3, and all examples were retired that same year. The total number built would end up being around 6,500. And as only the VVS would use it, the only other examples would be one that Japan acquired through a defector, and captured examples that would wind up in Finland and Germany. Today, the exact number of existing lags is unknown, though a few do exist in museums, primarily in Russia. Despite its flawed beginnings, cursed oversight, and middling performance, the Lag-3 did accomplish something in that it formed the basis of Lavochkin's later LA-5 and LA-7, which were incredibly successful and popular aircraft in the VVS and established Lavochkin as a premier designer in the immediate post-World War II era for the Soviet Union's foray into jets.